You are watching Life on Gabriela TV, community television, for you, by you. Hi, Frank Moore here for Life on Gabriola TV. Today we bring you an excerpt from a recent meeting of the Gabriola Island Local Trust Committee. The committee is part of the Larger Islands Trust, which has a mandate from the BC government to preserve and protect the islands and waters of the Salish Sea. That's the body of water between the mainland and Vancouver Island that also stretches down to Washington State, though the Americans take care of that part. And it's the latter aspect of their mandate that the Trust Committee is tending to in this excerpt, protecting the waters. In it, bylaw enforcement officer Warren Dingman reports on legal actions taken regarding structures built too close to the water in contravention of what are called setbacks, that is, the distance that must be maintained between the structure and the shoreline. His report covers 14 files addressing violations mainly on private properties. It focuses on the ongoing case of a property on Mudja Island, which is just across a small ocean narrows from Gabriola. Dating back to 2012, the legal battle has now resulted in contempt of court proceedings. The result, says Dingman, of non-compliance with BC Supreme Court orders. But there's more at stake than just bylaws. According to the chair of the committee, Peter Luckham, sea level rise as a result of climate change means that land and sea are more interconnected than ever. Increasingly, properties on land impact marine ecology, and structures built too close to the shoreline are vulnerable too. In other words, a rising tide lifts all boats, but it may also impact your property in ways you don't want. Here now is that conversation. And is Warren Dingman here with us? I see his screen illuminated good there. Afternoon, good afternoon, Chair. Well, good afternoon, uh, Warren. Warren, and uh, thank you for your work and thank you for your advice on the Thews Island uh, in stuff last earlier in the week and appreciate all of that. And uh, here we are on Gabriola Island and um, we have a report from you with a recommended uh, motion that we just received this for information. And so indeed, by the fact that it's on our agenda, we would do that. But I'll turn it over to you to give us a, uh, a summary. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so this report summarized the current uh, shoreline structures and setback contraventions and legal action involving uh, such structures. Uh, there's currently 14 files uh, for the local trust area as a whole. And as I said, they're equally divided between Gabriel and Mudge, so seven on each island. Uh, note that Mudge does have a greater setback from the sea uh, than Gabriel, so there's more of a potential for setback contraventions. Mm -hmm. um, and I've also noted here that with the, when we recall these files, that even though these files uh, involve structures on private property, the majority of the time and not actually on the foreshore, we use the foreshore reference in our filing system to reflect uh, uh, and identify those contraventions that are in that entire sensitive ecosystem area, the actual land below the natural boundary of the sea and, and just above it. Um, so I also go on to, to, to document that we have issued violation notices uh, for some of these contraventions. Uh, many of them will move towards uh, compliance without uh, further action. Um, I, what is not specifically noted here is uh, for one of the files, they have submitted uh, uh, a DVP application to try and get uh, uh, the structure legalized with that permit from the local trust area. And the remainder of the uh, report really deals with the Mudge Island case involving Mr. Defonseca, for which there was have been multiple court cases, and also where we're now involved in contempt of court proceedings, as we have not been able to get compliance, uh, or uh, in, with contempt of court, this comes down to 
the courts, BC Supreme Court orders have not achieved compliance uh, for that property, uh, but the work continues and uh, there may be further content of court proceedings in order to get compliance and the removal of those structures on that uh, property. And you have the attached decision, uh, the Court of Appeal decision uh, for the case of uh, Fonseca versus the Cape Brown Local Trust Committee. Um, and in the final recommendation, I note that um, I don't I don't see any trends here. This is just sort of a way, unfortunately, routine work. I don't see uh, some dramatic increase in the number of structures being built, at least along uh, within these setback areas. We're not seeing a rapid increase in the number of complaints regarding these setback areas. So in the end, uh, I provided the report for information. And in my opinion right now, there's no uh, action that's required by the LTC to address any uh, ongoing issue with these four store structures. And I, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's the extent of my comments and I can take any questions. I had a question. Um, this is super helpful report. Thank you very much, Warren. Um, I think it's definitely true that there is a misunderstanding among property owners regarding their rights um, and where they can build. So it's good to have that stated. Um, I'm thinking about those two properties on the Strand. And I, I believe they're still asking for development variance, right? So Correct, they have, they have open planning applications and planning staff are working on those files. Yeah, and so to follow up on that, um, <laughs> why why is the process this way? Yeah. Somebody builds an illegal, unlawful structure yeah, in the foreshore, and then they go and open an application file, they pay the money, we go through the process, and then we have to say, no, we don't approve this, and now you have to take down the structure. Like, it, uh, could we not enforce against this? Uh, like. I'm sorry, but this just seems such a waste of runaround time because uh, and further. So I, I would say that the, the property owners, once we get the complaint and we discover the contravention, they do, they get I mean, the opportunity to try and fix the problem and bring the property into compliance. And one of their options is uh, they do have the right to submit these applications and try and get uh, approval from the local trust committee for the structures. Yes, it's after the fact, uh, but, uh, and the courts have ruled on this. These applications must be dealt with on their merits. And uh, the local trust committee must give, uh, you know, full consideration to the application, decide on its merits, whether or not they would grant the, the permit and then proceed uh, from there. And I think that's just part of procedural fairness that um, that option is available to the property owner. And I don't believe there's an option to say, okay, no, you cannot submit this application. We'll. Uh, that just seems so it. contrary to common sense. Because just to give you an example, uh, the two on the strand, I wouldn't even have known about these, you know, until we got the report. Except that one day when I was walking on the strand, one of the neighbors came up to me just frantic, saying, you won't believe what's happening down there and blah, blah, blah. And like, they were so upset about it. And, and then they didn't know what to do. And I said, well, you'll need to submit a, a complaint to the Islands Trust, which is kind of horrible because now the neighbor is responsible for reporting this. Meanwhile, all the building, all the cement moving, all this stuff is still happening on the foreshore. All the damage was being done on the foreshore and then it's built and completed and then they come to us and now we just look so bad if we say well actually we don't approve that when <laughs> it just seems so it's it's awful it, it isn't procedurally fair if something is in contravention of our bylaw and then they're allowed to make an application for it after the fact i mean that may be a procedure but i don't see how it's adjust because then of course they go to court and say well we've already spent all this money and we've already done all these major 
cement building and all this stuff. And now what now we, how can we possibly, and it just seems, it, that doesn't seem fair to them either. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for, this is the, that, that particular case was the reason I think, well, one of us had asked for the report. And so uh, the summary is really valuable. And I think to understand the broader context and particularly the analysis about the the un misunderstanding regarding the rights to build on the property in the setback from the sea. Um, some view the setback regulations as a seizure of land by Islands Trust, and many maintain they have the right to protect their property from erosion. So this is going to become a more active conversation. With and climate I, change, yes. And I think having this report um, puts us in a good position to be able to explain things to property owners on the waterfront um, and to look at our, we may need to look at the setback area as well. Why does Mudge have such a a large setback and Gabriel is, is only 7.5 meters? Uh, I believe it's a newer land use bylaw adopted in either 2007 or 2008. The work on the Gabriola land use bylaw and official community plan would have happened in the 90s. And then after we get past the turn of the century, there's more awareness of any uh, threat of sea level rise. So uh, that's, you know, my interpretation of what happened. Uh, it, it's like after, the, like a new generation of land use bylaws that came in in the 2000s, put more yeah. consideration into, do we need a greater setback area? Where the mm -hmm. ones in the 90s primarily looked at, okay, what was the standard set in 1972? when right. a lot of regional, 1971 or 1972, when the regional district brought in their, the first zoning and land use bylaws, uh, there just seems to have been a continuation for the next 25 to 30 years. And then once you get into the 2000s, the local mm -hmm. trust committee seemed to took, take more control and took a harder look at uh, what an appropriate uh, setback area is. That's why you have some land use bylaws with the old seven and a half meters. And some of those older regulations were just for buildings, not all structures. And you see the transition in the land use bylaw with the amendments from the seven and a half meter setback to a seven and a half meter setback for all structures, buildings with all structures. And then for some islands, an increase to 15 meters. And then Mudge has the 30 meter one. It can be adjusted with a geotech report back to seven and a half meters, but you do need that professional advice that it's safe to build below that 30 meters before it's lawful to do so. Oh, and why a geotech report? So it's not due to sensitive ecosystem, it's due to stability and or it's gonna get washed away. Yes, I, I can reference the bylaw, but yeah, I don't believe it was through protection of, primarily protection of natural environment. If you would That's like, I can get the wording here from that bylaw. Well, that's good to know because if, as we go into our OCP review, we want to be clear if we would, for instance, want to increase the setback from the natural boundary of the sea from 7.5 meters to 15 or even to 30, if it's, you know, if that's not a wise choice because you'd have to then get geotech reports and then how many people would be in contravention of that new bylaw because be everybody's, yeah, they'd be grandfathered, I guess. But a better approach might be uh, DPAs for right. all lines instead of. Um, so the exact wording from the Mudge Island bylaw through the chair is that they want, uh, you can get it reduced to seven and a half meters where the frontage of the sea is adequately protected from erosion by natural bedrock as certified by a qualified professional. So it doesn't say exactly a uh, geotech, but a qualified professional. And if they get that report, that certification, then the setback can be reduced to seven and a half meters. Hmm. Yeah, maybe I'll just make a few remarks on just starting from the last thing you said there. Certainly it remains a decision of the LTC as to whether or not they want to approve it. It's just that that engineering report in, would indicate that the, um, that down this there wouldn't be any engineering reasons not to do that. But if there were environmental concerns that the LTC had, um, they're not obligated to issue that development permit, are they? So this is actually not, this is just right in the land use bylaw. 
and mm -hmm. it's a regulation that yes could be amended but right now the regulation is that it's a 30 meter setback unless you get this certification from a professional saying it can be reduced and that they're supposed to state that the properties is adequately protected from erosion mm -hmm. Yeah, what I was referring to was whether we could put in place DVPs for shoreline protection as a better measure to protect rather than increasing the setback area, which would then incur costs by having to prove slope stability or whatever. Do, what, do you know any other islands? Which ones have shoreline um, DVPs? I don't think Maine. Um, Salt Spring certainly does. Um... Galliano does, uh, off the top of my head, uh, but uh, I don't believe that North Pender has some, but not full shoreline. But uh, certainly Galliano does, and Salt Spring. I think those are the most, uh, I would say, detailed regulations for development permit areas and protection of that foreshore areas. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and certainly setting a setback is the simplest thing that we can do that provides protection. And I just wanted to add that, uh, as it, uh, Warren has indicated, that this is certainly a change from the 70s, we'll just say, as a demarcation in time until up until the 90s, maybe 2000. But certainly from 2000 to now, 20, time is fleeting, 2024 now, there's certainly a lot more uh, rigor behind the science around environmental protection and that the science that we've come to understand um, associated with sea level rise is the environmental, the marine environment impacts that occur from upland property uses. And so uh, the 30 meters, although somebody said, well, why is it so large? It's actually 30 meters is actually a uh, recommended best practice and that seven and a half meters is why is it so small would be the question that I would ask because it's the interaction between the shore near shore habitat and the marine environment that supports the marine ecosystems that's important to recognize um, not to mention uh, if you place a house within th those proximities of the shoreline you're you're placing the house in a vulnerable location or whatever building and placing them in a vulnerable location um, that is just also not considered to be a best practice with it with respect to storm surge and sea level rise and all the rest of it so i'm glad that we have this report we could no doubt talk about it at length certainly in some respects we need to provide the opportunity to public to uh, new property owners to know and actually i think what's important there is that changing the setbacks doesn't affect existing properties or buildings it doesn't exist existing buildings they would be uh, legal non-conforming it only affects new development and um and it's the new development that seems to be more problematic than um even existing development yeah yeah totally yeah. so really glad to have this here and um yeah i don't have any further questions but thank you for the report and the uh, decision uh, on the defund sector case I don't have any more questions either. Just one comment that one of the things that this report kind of reminded me of is that when we um, update our land use bylaw, one of the things I really want to see is a longer setback for Gabriola shoreline. Um, and even though it, it will not apply to everything that's already built and being built right now, any protection that we can get um, is going to be will be a good thing so that it definitely brought that to my attention so i'm hoping that uh somehow we can get this concern into our ocp land use bylaw update bucket or the report for the file um for well this file or no? let's do something with it so that it is absolutely not lost it's always in my head but yeah 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 um nerissa has some advice to offer Oh, thank you. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, if you do want to make uh, a resolution, it will make sure that it is tracked and we don't miss it. Excellent. I move that the Gabriel Island Local Traffic Committee um, direct staff to include this report yeah, in good. the OCP review update materials, materials for staff. Yeah. <laughs> so that we do not lose focus on the importance of uh, shoreline setback. 
So the Behavioral Local Trust Committee directs staff to include this report in the OCP review update materials. I don't know if you need your rationale about the losing focus. It's well, people might wonder why it's yeah. in there. Well, or I wouldn't. But anyway, up to you. Your motion. Yeah. Can I hear the motion back from the recorder? It's moved that the Gabriel Island Local Trust Committee direct staff to include this report in the official community plan review update materials so that we don't do not lose focus on the importance of shoreline setback. Thank you, recorder Millard. Um, and I do want to include that last bit in there because I envision this will go past my term as a trustee. <laughs> so. so that's your intention. And do I have a seconder for that motion? I will second. Thank you very much. Any further discussion? <clears throat> all, all those in favor? Aye. Uh, that carries unanimously. Thank you. Thanks, Randy. Warren. Yes. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you very you. much, Warren. And I'm sure we think that in any future um, bylaw enforcement files that you bring us associated with four-line structures, you'll use this as a reference material. So thank you very much. <laughs> we just made his work easy. <laughs>